confession of sin is, re is returning to the Father and being honest with Him about your life and, and sharing with Him, you know, the desire that you have to be connected to Him, to be intimate with Him. And it's a parental, it's a parental requirement. It's not a judicial requirement, it's parental. So we're going to talk tonight about human good. So uh, let's, let's go to the Lord. Well, Father, we are grateful that uh, through faith in Jesus Christ, through his death, burial, and resurrection, that while he hung on the cross, all the sins of the world, past, present, and future for every human being, were poured out on him and judged, and he paid the price in full for all sin, all sin. There's not ever been a sin committed or never will be that's not already paid for. So he died physically. He said, uh, he said, I'm finished. It's finished. And he breathed out and gave up his spirit. And then at that point he died physically and three days later came back from the grave, came back to life. Those three things, his death, burial, and resurrection are what we call the gospel. And those are the things that we must believe to be saved. And if you've believed those things, then at this point, in your life, you need to, to confess any known sin that you might have, mostly mental sins, anxiety, worry, fear, uh, anger, bitterness, jealousy. Those types of sins need to be confessed privately and silently to the Father. Thank you, Father, again for faith in Christ to make us part of the family. And we pray now that you'll give us insight in this, into this lesson in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, I'll give the gospel to try to clarify for anyone online because we don't know who's who's online now we, we're having a change in our whole congregation the people that are listening in now there's I put on Facebook before I came a message to all the people that are my friends that I would be doing this so I'm expecting there's several that might be online listening so don't know if they're these are old high school friends I don't know if they're clear on the gospel so if you're out there you need to be clear on the gospel but tonight we're going to talk, get a little deeper than the gospel and talk about the difference between divine good and human good. It's a really important topic. In order to begin the discussion of it, let me talk about God and God's glory. Because God and his glory sets up the stage for understanding the importance of good deeds. The deeds and the doings, the works that are, they're called. God in eternity past was three persons, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they existed all by themselves in perfect harmony, in perfect happiness. They were not lonely. They were not in need. Way, For all eternity is as we can envision time. They lived in eternity past on their own, with each other, and they were completely joyful with each other. But at some point, they said, we would like to share this joy and this awe we have of each other in ourselves. We want to share this with creatures. So they created angels. Then they created man. And the goal of creating angels and man was to share their inner essence with creatures. You see, you say, you say to people, I guess I should take off my hat, but you say to people, you know, everything works for God's glory and God's praise. And people say, well, what is, what is this guy? He's, why does he need so much praise? You know, if he's so together, why does he need praise? Well, it's not that God needs praise. The word glory means to, to show what's inside by something you do on the outside which evokes awe and praise. For instance, a great athlete in the, during World War II, Jesse Owens went over in the Olympics and showed them all up. They couldn't keep up with him. He had great glory. What he did is he showed what was inside of himself by doing something outside, by through his deeds. Well, the glory is the inner thing that's manifested outwardly and the response to that. For instance, Jesus said the lily, 
the flower, has more glory than Solomon in all of his dressed up glory. And, and a lily starts as a little bulb. It's ugly. It's not attractive at all, if you've ever seen one. You put it in the ground and you water it and the magic happens and it sprouts out and produces a flower that's very beautiful. The glory of the bulb of the lily is the flower. Inside that bulb were those inner qualities that when, when the right things happened, showed itself and everybody's in awe of the beauty. Well, this is God. God has revealed himself called glorifying himself so that creatures could come to know him and be in complete awe. Because to know God is to be in awe of God. It's just to be, he is literally the greatest, coolest, most wonderful, beyond the pale of anybody that's ever lived or existed. He is greater than anyone. And once you know that and, and come to have a personal connection with him, it's just something that's incomparable to anything else in your life. There's not another love that's, ev that's even close to that. Not another love. So God has created all of this for the purpose of revealing himself to us that we might come to see how wonderful he is and share all that with him. See, he's simply sharing himself with us. He's sharing his love. The older I get and the farther I go, the more I see that fathers, this is what fathers do. Fathers gain stability and love in their own life and they share that with their children and their family and their wife. They share that stability. They share that confidence that things are going to be all right. That it sets that tone and everybody clings to that. Everybody looks to that and it's a tone that's set where he becomes the rock. And he reveals the very love and stability of God through his own stability. He reveals it. And people are like, wow. We had someone this week, Rhonda and I were sitting at the table talking to a young lady, and um, something came up about spiritual growth, and I was explaining how it works. And I said, and then, you, you know, once you grow to a point, you get to a point in your life where nothing can knock you down. You're strong and so strong in the Lord that nothing can knock you down. And she said, like you two, me and Rhonda. And I said, like me and Rhonda, nothing's going to knock us down. We're going to keep getting up and turning to the Lord and hanging on to the Lord no matter what. Nothing's going to knock us down. We're not going to quit. We're not going to give up. We're not going to go off in the Thule's. We're going to keep on trucking. Going to keep on trucking. Keep on moving toward God, moving toward God, moving toward God to know him, to understand him, to understand his glory. See? So now the, the second idea I want you to understand is the role of good deeds. Now, none of this is on your paper. The stuff I thought about on the way home, I just drove five and a half hours. So I'm a little whooped. But the other is the role of good works. The world believes that God is all about good deeds. In fact, the world believes that God keeps score. The unbeliever's good deeds. He keeps score of your good deeds and your bad deeds. And whichever one you've got the most of is what you, where you're going to go. If you've got more good deeds than bad, then you're going to heaven. If you've got more bad deeds than good deeds, you're going to hell. And God doesn't work that way at all. That's not even close to the way the system works. Christ hung on the cross and took all the bad deeds and the penalty for all the bad deeds, every single one of them, the penalty for all the bad deeds went on him. And the Father in heaven punished him for all the bad deeds. Okay? So bad deeds don't count in this. There are no bad deeds in the system. They're gone. And the penalty, we call them sins. The penalty for all that is wiped away. It's gone. There's, you can't even find it. God said, as far as the east is from the west, I have removed your sins. 
So if you were to go up to heaven and open up the file cabinet and look for your sins, you know what you would find? Nothing. The file is empty. They're gone. See, everybody worries about all the sins they commit and how God is up there in heaven waiting to get them and waiting to hurt them and waiting, you know, to be angry with them for their sins. Sins are gone. Just like sins don't count in the sense of your, your judicial uh, destiny, listen, neither do the good deeds. The good deeds don't count. Not for where you're going to end up. Once you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, and you believe that and receive him as your Savior, you become part of God's family. And you begin to, if you, if you choose and understand and you're fortunate enough to find somebody that teaches you how to grow and you decide to grow up spiritually, then you reach a point in your life where you have a relationship with God and where your motives, your desires are to please him, to serve him, and to further his work. That's when your deeds really begin to count. They really begin to matter for his team. And that's what we want to get into tonight and try to help you understand. Because we have good deeds, what we call good deeds, bad deeds, and what we call human good. Human good is basically good deeds done for human reasons, human motives for a human agenda that don't further God's plan. They further your plan or someone in the world's plan. And we'll try to define that and explain it. One of the most difficult concepts to understand is the difference between divine good and human good. It's not easy. This is a little, this is a little tough, so hang in here. Much of what passes as Christian good works is actually human good. I'm going to say most of it. Much of what I've done in my life that I called Christian deeds was probably human good. Because I did it for myself. I did it to promote myself, to make myself look good. I, I, I put myself in front of people for the sake of gaining notoriety or to get praise. It was for me. It wasn't for God. It was for me. Now, not, the only person that knows your motives is you. That's why Paul's going to tell you in 1 Corinthians 4, don't judge anybody's motives. Don't believe or think that you can see into somebody's brain and figure out what they're thinking. Stop doing that. Stop judging. So, this discussion will attempt to clarify the difference between divine good and human good. Divine good is acceptable to God. It's rewardable. You'll, you'll get rewards for it in eternity. Human good is rejected by God. It's worthy only to be burned up at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, two words for good in the Greek Bible. One is K-A-L-O-S. The other is A G A. T-H-O-S, kalos and agathos. Kalos is a word that means good in the sense of something pleasant, something desirable, enjoyable. When someone says, did you have a good day? What they're asking you is, did things go your way? You know, did the lights turn green? Okay. We, we get off of the interstate down here in Trussell, and we go left, and if, we're, if we hit it right, we can hit all the lights. And boy, do I try to time it. I'll slow down or speed up just a little bit to try to hit all, all the way home. I can hit all the lights. That's a good day. That's a Kalos day. But let me tell you, this Agathos day means good from God's perspective, and often that's a day when I hit all the red lights and my patience is exposed for its lack thereof. Okay? My patience is exposed. 
That's agathos. At the end of football practice, we ran wind sprints, 40-yard dashes. We hated them, hated them. You know, hyperventilating and everything, throwing up, the whole thing. What was the purpose? So that when fourth quarter came, we would be in shape and we could win. That's agathos. The coach said, this is good for you. We're like, we can't see how this is good for anything or anyone. Because we're thinking kalos. We want it to be enjoyable. You know, fun, beneficial in the sense that we can see it. But he said, no, this is agathos. It's good for you from a, a building standpoint. So that's the difference between the two ideas. Now, determining the value of good that we produce is determined by what God thinks about it. The world has a way of determining what is good and what is not good. The world says anything that helps people is good. Anything that hurts people is bad. God says it's not near that simple. You can do things to help people, but you're not doing it to further the plan of God. And in any way, you're doing it to further maybe uh, the plan of Satan. For instance, here, let me give you an example. Globalism. Do you know what globalism is? Globalism was the great, one of the great issues in this last election. Globalism is the idea that the world and all the nations of the world should join together and become one and have one government, and that's how we, they would achieve peace. This is actually foretold. This actually will happen. It's foretold at the end of your Bible in the book of Revelation when the Antichrist gets involved in human history. He's going to be able to bring this about, and God's going to let it happen. At this point, God's not, let it, not allowed it to happen, and... You know, because of this last election, you can see where God put a roadblock in it. He put a roadblock in it. Because that's where the last group of politicians was headed in a big way, to globalism. Now, why? Well, they think that, that they can help more people, do more good deeds, et cetera, et cetera. You know... What happens to a little baby? Now, this may seem odd and odd logic, but what happens to a little baby if it never has a chance to grow up and re reject Christ, but it dies at a, as a little baby? Where does it go? Heaven. goes to heaven. Didn't have a chance to say no. But what happens if it gets fed and grows up in a Muslim country where it's forced to be a Muslim What's the odds that it's going to trust in Christ and go to heaven? Slim. Slim. So the point being, let God sort it out. Stop trying to fix all the problems. It's human good. It's people trying to fix everything as if this is going to become some kind of utopia. This is not going to be heaven. There are whole denominations called Christian denominations that literally believe that our, the church's responsibility and goal is to bring about world unity. They're involved in this globalism push because they believe that when we get it all organized and back together and cleaned up, Christ will return, and not until. That's called dominion theology. They believe that we are to take dominion over the earth and re reclaim it for Christ as the church without him. Won't work. Can't work. It's not what the Bible teaches. It's not anywhere in the Bible, period, over or not. It's not anywhere in the Bible. So, but you get politicians going for that. You get the religious people going for that. And boy, you got something hard to beat. But God can do it. Now, let's talk about uh, 
why we are unable to produce things that pleases God. Let me give you just a basic concept, and you here all know this. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, it caused them to become sinners and lose their righteous standing before God. They became unrighteous they, in what the Bible calls spiritually dead. Do you remember when the Bible says, the day you eat of the fruit, dying, dying you will die or you will surely die? Well, there's two ideas of death. The day they ate of it, did they die? Did they die physically? No. They died spiritually. In other words, their, their spirit was cut off from God. 900 and something years later, they died physically. But that spiritual death has passed down to everyone. Now, this is where we have to get to our Bible. Romans 5.12. If you want to read that, Romans 5.12. I hope John's got some notes up there. I, I emailed them to him, but I don't know if he got them up or not. Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as through, through one man, Adam, sin entered into the world. That's Adam's original sin of eating the fruit. The reason it's charged to him, now Eve ate it first. He followed and, and let her influence him to eat it, but he was the head. He gets the blame. You hear that, guys? She was deceived. She didn't realize what she was doing, but he did. He chose her over God what he did. Men are still doing it today. Just as one man through one man sin entered the world and death, spiritual death through sin and so death spread to all men because all sinned in Adam. When Adam sinned, the Bible says we were all counted as sinners when he sinned. Now we do understand that here, right? You understand that? Everybody, you say, well that's not fair. I didn't, I wasn't there. I didn't do anything. Listen, everything God, God does is, is for your benefit. Trust me, you really, really want this to be the case. Because if you're dead in Adam, all it takes is one man to pay for the sins of the world and you can be transferred into Christ from Adam into Christ, Adam where everything's dead into Christ where everything's alive. That's what you want. That's what you want. You don't want to be out there on your own individually. So, Adam's sin, we call it Adam's original sin. Adam's original sin caused the human race to be born spiritually dead, separated from God, and unworthy to live with God forever. This is why everyone has to have a Savior. That's why Christ had to go to the cross. This one man is Adam, and in the sin that he, he, he committed produced spiritual death that has been given to all of us. Now, all mankind inherits this sin. We're born into it. We're born into the realm of spiritual death. We're, and listen, when you're spiritually dead, you're unable to produce anything spiritual. Listen, Robert, if you're spiritually dead... You can't produce anything spiritual, can you? Say no. No. Now, if you're spiritually alive, by contrast, you can produce something spiritual. Say yes. Good. Now, when you believe in Jesus Christ, you come out of this dead place, this dead realm, and you're transferred into this living realm. Right? Right? But what you you got to believe that he died for you, was buried, raised from the dead. And when you do, you're transferred. The Bible said you're transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved son. You're put into Christ. Connected to him forever. And whatever he is, you are. It's pretty cool stuff. Now, prior to salvation, nothing that we do is spiritual. 
I don't care how much you want it to be or how hard you work at it or how big a sacrifice. The people that go down to Mexico and crawl on their knees all of this way up to this statue. You know about that? I forget. It's the something way. I don't remember the name of it, but they make this great sacrifice as if all of this human sacrificing somehow makes them spiritual. Do you know what makes you spiritual? Very simple. Well, the indwelling and filling of the Holy Spirit. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you're given the Holy Spirit. He is the spiritual person that makes you now spiritual because you have the Holy Spirit to empower you and to open your eyes and your mind to be able to see now you can do something spiritual. Prior to salvation, prior to receiving the Holy Spirit, you can't do anything spiritual. So think about this. Here is a really nice grandmother, unsaved, never been saved, doing all these nice things for her grandchildren. And they look back and think how wonderful grandmother was. She was a great Christian woman because she did all these good things. It's what the world thinks. That's how the world describes. I asked a man down on the beach, I said, are you a Christian? He said, well, I try to be. I knew right away what he was saying. He thinks being a Christian is a way of behaving. Being a Christian is being registered in heaven with your book in the name of, uh, your name in the book of life. When you believe in Christ, you're transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into, the, into Christ. Your name is written in the book of life and you're saved in the family of God forever. That's what it means to be a Christian. Now, once you are become a Christian and you are a Christian, now we talk about the walk. All different. What you get at salvation is very different from the walk. Once you get it, though, you listen, you got it. You got it. Had a good chance to share the gospel with a lot of people this week, and it was really fun to do. In Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, let me read that to you. If you want to follow with me, if you don't, that's fine. I'm going to read it. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. See, spiritually dead. See, it can't be physically dead. That'd be, that'd be stupid. You were dead physically, and yet you're walking around doing stuff like Weekend at Bernie's. What a silly movie. You know they made three of those things? How the... <laughs> Now you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's the devil. So you're dominated by the devil. You're dominated by the world system of thinking, by the power of the air of the, son, of the spirit now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them all we too formerly lived by the desires of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. So the point is you were spiritually dead living your life before you were saved. You can't produce anything, any good deed you produce before you're saved is worthless to God. Worthless. So grandma does all these wonderful things for her grandchildren as an unbeliever, and every bit of it, none of it registers in, the, in, in heaven. Not any of it. And everybody looks on and thinks how wonderful Grandma is, and, and God's like, Grandma's done nothing that I can recognize because Grandma is not saved. She's not saved just because she does, does a bunch of good stuff. So... In Matthew 19, 17, a man came up to Jesus. This is important. A man came up to Jesus and said, Hello, good teacher. And he called him Agathos. Remember Agathos? 
He called him good, Agathos, good teacher. And Jesus said, whoa, whoa, whoa. There's only one person who's worthy of the title Agathos. You know who it is? God. So the word Agathos is the same idea of being divine, of being perfect, of being righteous, holy. Agathos is that kind of word. So Jesus said only one is, is, is good in the sense of Agathos. Only one, and that's God. So, see, when we talk about good deeds, agathos deeds, these are deeds that only a person empowered by the Spirit can produce. Only if you're following the leadership of the Spirit and you're motivated to further God's plan is it divine good. Now, for the unbeliever and for the baby believer, this is really not a practical study because it's going to be a good time before they, they need to grow toward the ability to produce divine good. For mature believers, you and I, this is, this is important because, listen, we can go through days and days and days of a, at a time doing what we do and, and be out of fellowship and not be producing any divine good. We need, and, and what a waste. What a waste. I mean, we're not helping God at all. We're not on his, I mean, we're, we're off in the la-la land somewhere in autopilot. And we need to wake up and pay attention to what we're thinking. What am I thinking and what are, what are my motives for doing what I'm doing? And what, here's what you'll find. You'll find often that the reason you've done that is because there's someone in your life that you haven't forgiven. There's something in your life, an event occurred, and you got hurt and you've been out of fellowship really ever since. And you've not come back and cleaned all that up You've not come back and cleaned it all up so that you can stand freely, comfortably before the Lord and be focused back on His work, on, on what's good for Him. Because you're, you're in here grinding out your own unhappiness. Ever felt that way? You ever spent days and days like that? Of course you have. Of course you have. We all have. That's how, that's how this life works. Listen, when things happen, we either go to God or we go to, go to bitterness. It's the only two options you really have. You either go to God and you forgive and you let go and it lets you off the hook to keep growing and to keep loving and keep being the person that God designed you to be. Or if you go bitterness, you get tangled up and locked up in your own misery. It's ridiculous. Oh, you can't learn, you can't serve, you can't grow, you can't do anything. And I, this, didn't even have, this is just within you. You're all locked up. Now, at the point of salvation... We're given eternal life, spiritual life. We're transferred from the realm of death to the realm of life in Christ. This enables us to produce spiritual, eternal good. Once we're saved in the Holy Spirit, the Spirit has the power to produce goodness that registers on God's scale. It registers. Before that, nothing registers. So either you're an unbeliever doing, quote, good things, it doesn't register, or you're a believer who's out of fellowship, your good deeds don't, don't register either. Now, let's, let me read you a little. Colossians 1.13 says you're delivered out of the realm of darkness and transferred into the realm of God's beloved Son. Romans 5.21 Sin reigned and ruled in death, but grace rules through righteousness to eternal life in Christ. 
Matthew 7, 17, the good tree, the agathos tree, in other words, the spiritual tree, produces good fruit. But the worthless tree produces evil fruit. So listen, if you look, you say, you say, I'm saved, but I look back on my time as an unbeliever, and I wasn't an evil person. I wasn't a bad person. I didn't hurt people. I didn't rob people or steal from people. I didn't do bad things. No, but what you did, because you weren't spiritual, was worthless in the plan of God. It was worthless. And that's why he calls you a worthless tree when you're unsaved. In 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15, you need to just turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 12 through 15. If you're online with us and you've got your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15, and we're going to show you what happens when you get to heaven. All believers that live in this period called the church age are going to be ganged up together when the rapture happens and everybody's uh, flown up off the earth. We all join up together in what's called the judgment seat of Christ. This is where all of us as believers, we get evaluated. Our life here on earth our, quote, our good deeds get looked at, evaluated for value, see if they're worth anything. And this is where in verse 12, 1 Corinthians 3, 12, if any man builds upon the foundation, which is Christ, believing in Christ with gold, silver, precious stones, this is divine good. This is good deeds you've done while motivated by the Holy Spirit. Good deeds you've done in the power of the Spirit. Good deeds you've done for the purpose of serving the Lord. This becomes gold, silver, and precious stones. Or your, what you committed, the deeds you committed, could be wood, hay, and stubble. He says, each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work which has been built remains, which means you can't burn gold, silver, precious stones, but your wood, hay, and stubble is going to burn up. Here's what's going to happen. All of your works are going to be put into a big fire. All of the things that you did, motivated by the Spirit for the right reason, are going to last. Those things will be the basis of your rewards. Those things you did for yourself, the good things you did just to please yourself, to make yourself look good, to make yourself feel better, to get yourself some uh, praise or to get yourself some thanks, get something in return. You know, Jesus talks about lending to those that can pay you back. Remember that? He talks about giving money to those that it can pay you. He said, what are you, a bank? You know, if, you're, if people will come to you and need help, give it to them. Or don't do it at all. Give it to them. Don't look for something in return. So, whatever that was divine good will, will survive the fire. It will survive the fire. Whatever is human good will burn up, will not survive the fire. And listen to what he says. If any man's work which he's built uh, remains, he'll receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, yet he himself shall be saved. Yet as through fire. So don't think you can lose your salvation because your rewards burn up. Because you get to heaven in your Christian life, you've been saved, but your Christian life was worthless because all you did was goof around. Or go to some goofy church where all they did was sing. Nothing wrong with singing, but if that's all you do, if you don't learn anything, you don't grow, you don't understand anything, there's no way that you can get to a mature place where you can produce divine good. You can't do it. 
So look, if you're out there listening to me, quit playing games with yourself. Quit going to a little, little funky church just because it's got a nice bunch of people and everybody's nice to each other and pats everybody on the back, you know. And on Wednesday night, they bring good pies, you know. They got the kind of pie you like. Go find you a church where somebody's going to teach you something and, and challenge you. Now, thirdly, the production of divine good requires a believer to be filled with the Spirit and motivated to further God's agenda. In Galatians 5, 16 through 25, he says, Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Because the flesh are the old man belief system, for those of us that understand that terminology, fights against the Holy Spirit and the new man belief system. You got an old way that you, that you developed when you were an unbeliever and you got a new way that you built since you've been a Christian. And those two fight each other. They, they pull against each other. Let's read that. That's really important. I saw some things in there I hadn't seen before. Galatians 5, 16. Walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. The flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh and they are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. He, and then he's going to go in verse 19 and talk about the deeds of the flesh. These are just some of the deeds of the flesh. This is not all of them. If you're led by the deeds of the flesh, which are evident, immorality, impurity, sensuality, and he goes on and discusses. He gets to verse 22 and he talks about the fruit of the Spirit or the works of the Spirit. That which the Holy Spirit produces in the believer's life to perform. He talks about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Do you realize these are all inward? Not a single one of them is an outward deed. They're all inward deeds. They're all things that you think and believe and feel. Gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law. Now, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit and not become boastful, challenging one another and envying one another. So, you can't produce divine good out of fellowship when you're envying, fighting, Biting each other, hurting each other. Listen, getting your feelings hurt. It's so easy for us to get our feelings. Somebody says the wrong thing and we're just get our feelings hurt, all huffed up. Listen, you have to grow and become spiritual to learn how to overcome that stuff. I mean, if somebody that you love says something to you that hurts you, it's very difficult not to react. It's very difficult especially if you care about them. The goal is to get to a place where you are so plugged into the Lord and so ready to forgive, you've got your finger on the forgiveness trigger, just ready to forgive, ready to forgive. Just don't let yourself go there. Stop it and don't go there to this place of self-pity where you grind out your misery uh, by imagining how this person hurt you. Oh, you see it over and over. You just tell, tell the story again and again and again. Again and again and again. You just rethink it, reimagine it. And finally, maybe one day, hopefully you don't get through the day like that, you confess all that and go back to the Father and say, you know, I don't care whether they meant it or not. And norm, look, do they normally not mean, if they're your loved one, do they normally not mean that? Easy to under, misunderstand, isn't it? Easy to misunderstand. And listen, even if they did in that moment, 
even if they did in that moment. So what? So what? I mean, so what? You know, forgive them, go over and kick their butt and get on with it, you know? Go tell them don't do that again. I'm talking to you ladies. Human good, listen, human good is any and all good deeds done by the unsaved or unspiritual carnal believers for the purpose of supporting, promoting, or to bring honor to anyone but God. You have to be unspiritual with the wrong motives. See, in Colossians 1, 15 and 16, we we're told that Christ is the creator. All things were created by him and for him. Now listen, when I was a much younger believer. I didn't really understand that everything that I was supposed to do in this life was supposed to be for him. I reacted against that and I said, you, you're telling me I can't, I can't, if I go to the movie to watch a movie, I got to do it for Jesus. I can't just go and just relax and be myself and enjoy something of my own. What I've learned is the Lord says, sure you can, son, but it's waste. It's wasted. That's not why I've left you there. I've left you there to do things for my sake. You're a warrior. You're one of my warriors. You're to act as if you're a warrior. You're in the war. You don't have time off. We're not taking naps here. We're not taking, we're not, you don't get to retire. Okay? You don't get a furlough. See, somebody says, well, you do, do you believe in vacations? I believe in vacations in the sense that vacations make you a better warrior because everyone has to rest. Everyone has to recreate. Everyone has to have fun and spend some time with family and do those things that let you regroup. That's why a vacation is important. But to see many, many people feel if they get enough money, they can retire from the workforce and spend all their time doing fun stuff, just doing fun stuff. Good luck with that, you know, good luck with that. You know, I mean, if you can do all that fun stuff for the Lord and the Lord doesn't expect anything else of you, then, hey, hey, I salute you. But I'm going to say, if you're honest, he, you're going to find he does expect a little more from you than just, okay, I got enough money. I'm going to go have fun. I'm going to go climb every mountain and surf every wave and, you know, do all that stuff that you see in the movies. All right. I've given you examples like uh, globalism is an example of human good. Every, every moment of ex ex existence is intended to be fully devoted to Christ. When you use your time or God's time that he's entrusted to you for, for your own glory instead of his, then you've hijacked his time. Human good is motivated to promote the self in some way, to get recognition, to clear a guilty conscience, to seek appreciation, to get thanks, or to get something in return. Human good always expects something in return. Unbelievers will use their human good to trying to persuade God to allow them into heaven. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. When people get to the great white throne, where this is the very end of human existence, Either you're going to go with God or you're going to go throw into the lake of fire and you've not believed in Christ. Everybody's going to pull up all the good things they did in their life and all. And listen, God has kept a uh, score of all. He's kept a book with all those good deeds in it. And so you're going to bring up all your good deeds and he's going to have them right there in his book and he's going to add them all up. You know what they're going to be worth? Zero. They're not going to be worth anything to buy your way into heaven because to get into heaven, you must have the righteousness of God. The only way you get the righteousness of God is by trusting in Jesus Christ and you don't earn it or work for it. He gives it to you because you believe in him. So divine good is any and all deeds performed while the filling of the spirit 
and motivated to further the plan of God. For instance, if you're filled with the Spirit and your motive is to do this for the Lord, no matter what you do, if you clean the toilet, if you sweep the floor, if you do your work where you go to work and do your job, you do it to further the divine plan, that's called divine good. Everything that you do, empowered by God, motivated to serve God, to serve his plan, is, is divine good. But that's the key to it. You've got to be filled with the Spirit. You've got to be motivated for God. And motive is key. Let me read you 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Paul's going to tell you this. See, listen, the Corinthian church had a multitude of teachers. And people came through there and stopped and spoke all the time, like Peter and Apollos and Paul. And different people would come through. They had a really wonderful church. Big, fancy, wealthy church. But they they squabbled about who was the best. And they squabbled about who was the best of this and who was the best of that. And they judged each other. In chapter 4, 1 Corinthians 4, 1, let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, however, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Your job is to be faithful, not to be flashy. But to me, it is a very small thing if I should be judged by any of you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. Now listen to this. This is real important. This is a mindset Paul finally came to understand how he was supposed to think about himself and others. He said, I'm not supposed to, I don't know what you're thinking, Marion. I don't know what your motives are. There's no way for me to know. So I'm going to let you and the Lord work that out. And I'm going to, I'm going to act as if everything in your soul is great, unless you reveal to me that it's not. Then I'm going to try to help you get it back on track. But I'm not supposed to know, and I don't know, and I'm not going to judge, and I'm not going to determine what Robert's got going on in his mind. I don't know what Robert's got in his mind or his reasons or his motives. So Paul said, I learned to let that be. Leave it alone. Let other people work their salvation out with fear and trembling before the Lord. Don't get involved in it. And he said, to me, it's a small thing if I should be judged by you or anyone else even a human court. He says, in fact, I don't even judge myself. Now listen to what he says. I am, I am conscious of nothing against myself. What he says is that what examining that I do of myself, I can find nothing that I would call wrong. All of my sins are confessed. I'm right where I need to be. I'm in the will of God. I'm territorial where I'm supposed to be. I'm right where I'm supposed to be. Boom. I'm there. But he says, I don't know that. I don't know that that's true. It's as far as I can tell. I'm not aware of anything, but I don't even, I've quit trying to judge myself. I quit walking around nitpicking everything wondering if every motive is right and every motive, you know, I just quit doing it and I try to serve the Lord. But watch what he says. I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. Just because I don't know of anything against myself doesn't mean that I don't, that there's not something against me. The one who judges is the Lord. He says, now, Therefore, stop passing judgment before the time. This is what they were doing with each other. They were judging each other. Stop passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in darkness and reveal the motives of men's hearts. Then each man's praise will come to him from God or his reward. So here's what he's saying. 
Stop judging each one, each everybody. Stop determining, you know, uh, you know, he did that for selfish reasons or he did that, you know, just to get attention. You know, who knows? You don't know. You don't even really know yourself. Wait till the, wait till the Lord comes and he's going to lay everything out and bring to light all of our motives regarding all of our deeds. And whatever is divine good is going to get rewarded. Whatever was human good, where we did it for ourselves, to serve ourselves, to praise ourselves, to promote ourselves, it's going to burn up. And he said, I don't know what's going to burn up and what's not yet. And I've quit worrying about it. I've quit worrying about it. I just try to stay in the spirit. That's pretty hard itself, isn't it? Stay in the spirit. So, divine good is any deed or all deeds performed while filled with the spirit and motivated to further the plan of God. Finally, the production of divine good requires the believer to exchange old man beliefs for the beliefs of Jesus, i.e. new man beliefs, putting on the new man and living out the new man belief system. And we've got passages, Romans 12, to be transformed by the re renewing or renovating of your mind. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, take off the old and put on the new. Romans 12, 9, have love without hypocrisy, despise evil and cling to the good. The idea here being that as you change What's in your heart over time, more and more of the old is removed and more and more of the new is replaced. I, I talked to a man. I'm do, I do quite a bit of marriage counseling, as I've shared with you, and I've got a man that's come in and talked. And he, his problem is... He doesn't love his wife. I don't love my wife. I used to, and I did, you know, I've always been fine, but I've... So we've talked and talked for quite some time about what and where and where he's been and all that, and he, he called me the other day and said, I finally realized something. I'm still in love with my high school girlfriend. And I went, well, isn't that something? He said, how can that be? I mean, I left her when I was 17 years old. I haven't seen her since then. How can I still be attached? I said, well, it's because God designed the heart to work that way. Once you attach your heart to something, it stays attached until you literally go in there and tell it to unattach, until you let go. I said, you never let go. I said, if that woman were to walk up to you today and look similar to the way she did before, the image in your mind, and tell you to come on, you're still attached. You're still attached. He said, from that long ago? I said, sure. So he said, well, how do I, how do I let go? How do I unattach? I said, well, in your mind, just imagine her and let her go. Just let her go. Keep do, just keep letting her go. Keep letting her go. Keep letting her go. Called me up later and said, you know I'm starting to love my wife again? You know why? I said, it's what Paul said. It's exactly what Paul said. When you take off the old, see, before you, when, you, when you're attached to this old thing, you got no room for anything else. And when you let it go, all of a sudden, his heart started looking for someone else to love. And there she was, been there all this time. And so he's starting to attach to his wife. And, and I said, he said, is that right? I said, no. No, don't do that. Don't attach to your wife. Attach to God. Attach to the Lord. Go attach to the Lord. Let him be your lover. And then you'll discover that you love your wife better than you ever, ever did ever dreamed that you could. You'll love her in a wonderful way. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for these concepts and principles, and I pray that you've made it clear tonight to some folks who've heard how this works.
human good and divine good. And I pray that you'll clarify it in their minds and help them understand. Those that heard the gospel for the first time, maybe they didn't understand the real issue, that it wasn't good deeds. It was believing in his work, not our own work. I pray that you clarify that for them and give them a clear choice to be saved by trusting in Christ. We love you, Father. We praise you in Christ's name. Amen.